Hello everyone, this video is going to go over the material from chapter 7, um, which covers different sampling technique, techniques. <laughs> so, um, estimating the frequency of behaviors and beliefs. Um, so this chapter is really going to be looking at um, external validity, so making sure that our studies can generalize to the population. And in order for our studies to do that, we need to make sure that the way that we're sampling that population um, is giving us an accurate insight to it. Okay, um, so first, a little review. We talked about generalizability, if the, if the study generalizes to the population, right? So that's really, again, what this, uh, this chapter is going to look at. So look at how well our results can generalize and how um, good our external validity is. Um, and in all, not in all cases will external validity be the most important thing to look at. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about figuring out what type of validity matters most and when um, different sampling techniques should be used. Okay, so before I get into that, just a little clarification on some terms. Um, so in this chapter, we're going to be talking a lot about populations. Uh, and samples of populations, but it's important that you understand the difference. Okay, so a population is an entire set of people or things in which you're interested in. So if you're doing a study, um, typically you have an idea of what population you want your study to generalize to. Okay, so and not in every study um, is our population going to be the same. Um, it's going to, again, depend study by study. A sample is a smaller set of people that is to taken from the population. Um, and then the last term here is census, which is if we sample every single member of the population, then it's conducting a census. So your book gives the example of like looking at a population like a bag of chips, right? We want the study to represent the entire population, the entire bag of chips. Um, when completing the study, if we take out all of those chips to see if they taste the same, they'll be completing a census. Say, right, we eat every single chip and record how they taste, for example. That would be a census. Instead of doing that, we might be interested in taking a sample of those chips. So instead of eating all the chips, eat maybe five or ten chips and see how they taste, right? So it's a smaller set of the entire population um, but hopefully can give you a good idea of what the entire population is. Okay, and there's going to be different ways we can get those samples. Some, some of those ways are going to be biased, so they're not going to be very good validity. Um, so if they're biased, it doesn't necessarily represent the population. If those samples are unbiased, then they're going to be random samples, and they are more likely to represent the population at interest. Okay, and we'll explain this more later on, but the first thing, again, what the researcher is going to look at is what the population of interest is. So again, every study is going to be different. Um, you're not necessarily trying to generalize your study to the entire population of the world, right, every time. Um, so the population of interest is the population that the researcher decides that they want their study to generalize to. Okay, so again, every study is going to be different, um, and it's really up to the researcher to determine um, who they want the study to generalize to, and it might just be based on like what the research they're doing. Maybe it's based on just the participants they're able to find, so they can't generalize to a larger population. Um, again, it just depends on the situation. Okay, so a population of interest might be laboratory mice. It could be undergraduate women. It could be men with dementia, right? So it doesn't necessarily have to be everyone, um, and, you know, Maybe the study is looking at, you know, how many women experience sexual assault. Um, and the researcher is at a college, so it's easy to sample undergraduate women. So that's the population of interest, even though technically that study could be done on a larger scale, looking at, you know, all women. Um, it could just be easier for the researcher to have a specific population of interest. Okay, so the researcher gets to decide this. Who is included in the sample depends on the population of interest. Okay, so depending on what we want the study to generalize to, we're going to sample different people. 
saying there's two different types of sampling categories, if you will, um, a biased sample and an unbiased sample. Um, all of these have a bunch of different terms for them. I'll show you on the next page. But a biased sample is unrepresentative, which means not all members of the population have an equal opportunity of being included. So this, a sample that's biased won't have good generalizability, okay? Um, a biased sample won't generalize well to the entire population because you're not getting a random assortment um, of people in that sample. The opposite of that is unbiased. An unbiased sample is representative, which means that all members of that population have an equal probability of being included in the sample. Okay, so ideally, if we want good external validity, we want an unbiased or a representative sample. Okay, because that's telling, giving us a good idea of the entire population and not just a select few. Okay, we can only make inferences from the sample of the population of interest if we have a representative or an unbiased sample. Again, the study only can generalize to the um, population if the sample is unbiased. Okay, so for example, back to that chip example, if we're trying to see how the chips taste, we're not going to do a census and eat all of the chips. We're going to only collect a sample of chips and eat them. Unbiased sample, say we want 10 chips. It's to grab a random 10 chips from that bag. Dump the bag out, grab 10 random chips, random, right? So that would be 10 random chips. So there could be some chips from the top, some chips from the bottom, some chips from the middle, small chips, big chips. Every single chip has an equal opportunity of being picked, right? A biased sample, unrepresentative, same thing, maybe you want 10 chips from the bag. A way to do a biased sample, maybe we pick the first 10 chips we can grab, but those chips are the chips at top, at the top. So maybe they're bigger chips, so they're chips that have maybe less seasoning because the seasoning falls to the bottom. Um, maybe we pick only the full chips. Again, maybe the full chips taste different than the broken chips. Maybe we grab 10 chips only from the bottom. Again, those are going to taste different from the chips at the top of the bag. So those would all be example of biased samples or unrepresentative. Okay, there's still a sample. It's just a small section of the population, but they're not representing what the entire population would taste like. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Um, so these are two categories of samples. Um, and we're going to talk about different ways to collect samples for each of these categories. Okay, so these are like your main headers for this chapter. Okay, so biased and unbiased. These terms have like five other different <laughs> um, terms that mean the same thing. So unbiased, which means we have good external validity. It can generalize to the population, right? Unbiased, also known as a probability sample, a random sample or a representative sample. So on the quiz or exam, you're gonna see all of these terms used interchangeably. So I'd make sure in your notes to have all of these guys written next to each other and say that they're externally valid and can generalize, okay? The opposite of that, the external validity is unknown. So there's not good generalizability. I can't say that word, I'm sorry. Um, this would be known as a biased sample, non-probability sample, non-random sample, and unrepresentative sample. So it's all the opposites, but these all mean the same thing. Okay, your sample is not representative, it's not random, it's not a probability sample, and it's biased. Okay, so make sure you have all these terms straight, and if you see any of these, you know what it's talking about. Your book gives some examples um, for different populations of interest and different sampling techniques. So we'll go through these more in detail in a minute. But just for example, to make sure you guys get got this down. So if your population of interest is Democrats in Texas, right? The entire population of Democrats in Texas. If you did a census, you would ask your questions to every single Democrat in Texas. Okay, in most cases, the census is going to be very expensive because that's literally every single Democrat in Texas. 
Um, so you want to get a sample of the Democrats. Biased ways to do that, um, so not representative, would be recruiting people sitting in the front row at the Texas Democratic Convention. Okay, so we know they're Democrats, they're in Texas, um, but it's biased because the front row of people at this Texas Democrat Convention might not represent all of the Democrats in Texas. Right? A, only certain specific type of person is going to be at the Democratic Convention to start. And sitting in the front row at the Democratic Convention is limiting, you know, the people that you're looking at even more. Okay, so that's not representative of all the Democrats in Texas. Okay, a way we could unbiased sample. Um, you could obtain a list of all the Texas Democrats from public records and then call a random sample through a randomized digit dialing, okay? So this way we know we have all the Democrats in Texas on our list, and then from those we're randomly calling however many we want to sample, okay? So these are just other examples. If you're still struggling, read through them, um, but I don't wanna waste your time. These are in your book, okay? So there's some ways to get a bias sample. Um, so one way that is, um, I guess, the easiest is to do a convenience sampling. Um, and that's sampling only those people who are easy to contact. Okay. So convenience sampling is just sampling people who are maybe at that convention. Right. It's easy. They're right there. You're there. Easy to get your sample. Um, maybe just calling people in the phone book is the easy way. Um, doing online polls is an easy way to find people. So there's a lot of different ways of sampling that can be considered convenience sampling. Uh, anything that you're just sampling, the easiest people is convenient. Okay. Um, back in the day, they used to do polls by calling landlines, um, which was a good way to do it back then because everyone had a landline. Obviously, now not everyone has a landline. So if you're calling landlines, you're doing a convenience sampling, um, and it's going to be biased, right? Because not everyone has a landline. So those people who do have landlines still aren't going to be representative of the entire population. Okay, so this study actually tried to compare that. So it looked at houses that had landlines only or landline and wireless and looked at the, you know, different things, current smoker, if they're drinking, you know, one heavy drinking day in the past year, flu vaccine in the past year. So they looked at landline houses, or wireless only houses, or no phone at all. And you can see the difference in the responses. Current smoker, right, 11.5 to 20.8. Um, there's differences, obviously, in these populations. So calling people just on their landlines, not a good way to sample the entire population. And so that can be seen as a, a convenient sample. Okay, that's just an example of that. Another way to get a biased sample or unrepresentative is just sampling those people who volunteer, which again, you can see in a lot of different things. So again, online polls. Um, if you just have a poll on Facebook and you have people sharing it, you know, not everyone's going to take that poll. So there's a self-selection bias, right? Because only the people who decide that they want to take the poll are going to take the poll. Um, so you don't get to really decide your participants. So again, the people who are the people who take online polls are going to be different than the people who ignore the online polls. Okay. So online polls are a great example of this. Um, and really the most prevalent thing that you're going to see um, so there's, this example was an online poll that, you know, was on Facebook or something asking about keeping a child in a rear facing car seat and what age, right? So it's just an, a biased sample. You can have online polls that are unbiased. So your book gives this example done by AAA, um, looking at road rage and aggression on the road. Um, so even though this was an online poll, they randomly sampled the people that were involved, right? It wasn't just whoever decided they wanted to take the poll could take the poll. They had a systematic way of contacting people and asking them to participate in the poll, okay? 
So self-selection, again, is only people who are volunteering, um, and that is always going to be biased and typically is going to be seen on online polls, okay? But not always. Okay, so those are some way of biased sampling. Um, we'll talk about more a little bit later on. Um, but ways to get an unbiased sample, okay? So unbiased sampling is ideal for getting good external validity, making sure that your sample can generalize to the entire population. Okay, so probability sampling, also known as random sampling, right? So this is unbiased sampling. Every member of the population has an equal chance of being selected. Okay, so there's a lot of different ways you could do this. Um, and again, this is most important when external validity is important. Okay, so one way we could do this is known as simple random sampling. Okay, and this is the easiest way. So you input your names and numbers or whatever um, of the entire population into a pool and randomly select a predetermined number of samples. Okay, so for example, that um, Democratic Convention example, they put everyone's phone number into a random number generator and then picked a random selection from everyone. Okay. Um, so that's the easiest way to do it. There's websites and stuff that you can put all of your numbers, all of your participants into and have a random um, selection drawn. Um, and that's ensuring that everyone has an equal chance of being selected. Okay, so that's simple random sampling. Easiest way. There's some other ways and we're going to go through all of these. Um, so cluster sampling, multi-stage, excuse me, sampling stratified random sampling, oversampling, and systematic sampling. So all of these are going to be unbiased. Um, I'm going to go through each of them and kind of explain, but also on EDUCAT, I've posted um, YouTube videos that explain what all of these are as well. Okay, so if you are confused by me and the book, try to watch those YouTube videos. Okay, so the first one, cluster sampling. So for cluster sampling, what you're going to do first is cluster participants within a population and then randomly select clusters to use and then all the individuals in each cluster are sampled. Okay, so that might be kind of confusing, but here's an example to clarify. So if your population of interest is high schools in the city which you live. Okay, so I'm from Crystal Lake, Illinois. There's four high schools in Crystal Lake, Illinois. Okay, so if you wanted to have a random sample of high school students in Crystal Lake, um, or this is saying the state of Pennsylvania, whatever, I don't know why it's saying different, random high schools in Pennsylvania, we'll just switch to their example. You start with a list of 925 public high schools. So each high school is considered a cluster, right? Because there are, you have 952 public high schools, so you have a million high school students. Instead of just starting with a million high school students, you break it into clusters first, so 952 clusters. Say you want to have 100 of those high schools picked, so you randomly select 100 of the high schools. And then of those 100 high schools picked, you include every student in the sample. Okay? So instead of randomly selecting just students, you're randomly selecting the high schools and then sampling all the students within those high schools. Okay, and that's called cluster sampling. Does that make sense, hopefully? Okay, so that's cluster sampling. Multi-stage sampling. Um, it's similar to cluster, but there's multiple stages. Um, so first stage, you have a random sample of clusters. The second stage is from the clusters, a random selection of people is chosen. Okay, so the same thing as the last example, say we're looking at high schools. You list all the 952 high schools, you select a random 100 high schools, but this time in multi-stage, instead of um, sampling all the students in the high school, you sample a random sample of students within each selected high school. See the difference there? So instead of just picking the clusters and then sampling everyone in the cluster, 
you pick your clusters and then have a random sample of students within each cluster. Okay, and that's known as multi-stage sampling. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, the next example is stratified random sampling. So this is another multi-stage technique. Um, so the researcher here is going to select specific demographic categories, such as race or gender, and then randomly select individuals from each category. Okay, so instead of dividing into clusters, you're dividing into strata, which are typically going to be demographic categories. So not just clusters of people who happen to be together, but specific demographic strata. Okay. So, for example, a group of researchers wants to be sure their sample of 1,000 Canadians includes people of South Asian descent in the same proportion as the Canadian population. So, in the Canadian population, about 4% are from South Asian descent. Okay, so the researchers start by separating the population into strata, right? So, they would have a strata of South Asian Canadians and a strata of other Canadians. Okay, and then they would sample each of their strata, they'll get random samples um, to make sure that out of the thousand Canadians they're sampling, 4% are from the South Asian strata and the other 96% are from the other Canadian strata. Okay, so it's similar to clusters, you're breaking them down into groups. But the groups aren't really like random assortments of people. They're strata that have meaningful, um, you know, I don't know, and whatever you want to call it, the categories. The categories are meaningful. Okay. So if you, you could do that at the high schools with male and females. So say um, in the high school example, you want to get a million high schoolers. Right? So instead of breaking down into groups and then breaking down into clusters and then redoing the clusters, maybe you break them into strata of male and female. Okay, And then randomly select 500,000 females, 500,000 males to get the 1,000. Okay, So the difference there is those stratas are meaningful. Hopefully this makes sense. This one I'm never sure in class if you guys can follow along. So online it's even more difficult. If you have questions, let me know. Send me an email. Okay. The next type is oversampling. So it's kind of similar to random, uh, stratified random sampling, but the researcher is going to overrepresent one or more groups. Okay. So the same example as last, you want to have a thousand people. We want to have South Asians in the sample. Um, so South Asians make up 4% of the Canadian population, um, but out of the 1,000, that would only be 40 individuals of South Asian descent. The researcher doesn't want to have that little of people of South Asian descent be included because that might not be enough to make an accurate statistical estimate. Um, so instead of having 40 South Asian, the rest... Um, you know, other Canadians, they have 100 South Asian and the rest other Canadians, right? So you're oversampling the smaller population to make sure that you're getting enough data. Because if you have like, say, 1% is, um, I don't know, Pacific Islander or something, 1%, only 10 people you're sampling, that's definitely not enough individuals to get, you know, statistical statistically significant results. So you get more than you need. And at the end, you would weigh the groups back to be correct. Okay, so oversampling is, again, dividing the groups into important strata, so meaningful categories. But instead of having exactly the right amount of each person, you know, each group in the category, um, you would have over representation of one of the groups to make sure that you have enough um, you know, participants. Hopefully that makes sense. Maybe yes, no. Okay. And the last type of random sampling is systematic sampling, which is kind of my favorite, I think. Um, so if I wanted to systematically sample the class, 
I roll two dice. One lands on five and the other lands on a three. So you would have a list of everyone in the class. The first number, you would start at the fifth person, and then you would use the second number, and every third person you would sample until the sample reaches a desired size. Okay? So systematic is you come up with a randomized way to sample the population. So instead of just putting it into a random generator and picking 10 people, you roll dice, start at, you know, the first number, which is five, and then every third person you would sample until you get to 10. Right, so every time you roll the dice, obviously it's going to be random, it's going to be different, um, so it's a good way to randomly select people from the population. Okay, so those are all ways of doing random sampling. Again, random sampling, unbiased sampling, representative sampling, um, increases external validity, because you're having a random assortment of people that are representative of the entire population. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Um, and make sure you know the difference between random sampling and random assignment. So it's important not to confuse these terms. Random assignment is when you are doing experimental design and you're assigning participants to groups at random. Okay, so random assignment increases internal validity. If you're doing a study, making sure that, you know, people in your control group or your experimental group are randomly assigned, okay? Random sampling is increasing external validity. I just wanted to clarify that, some terms that are easy to mix up. Okay, so here is just a little flow chart. So probability sampling, these guys we already talked about. So now let's talk about non-probability sampling. Okay, so some types of people are systematically left out. So this we can use if external validity is not a top priority. Um, so in some cases, unrepresentative or biased sampling could be quicker, could be cheaper, could be easier. And it's not always feasible that we have a random sample of people. So sometimes unrandom sampling, biased sampling, um, we'll be fine, okay? So we'll talk about some ways we could do this. So there's some different techniques. So we already talked about convenience sampling as well as self-selection. And those, again, are just um, terms that can kind of describe other ones as well. So these just make sure you know the definitions. There's not really, you know, step-by-step -step ways to collect convenience or self-selection. Um, but these each have, you know, explicit ways to do them. So purposive sampling, we have snowball sampling, as well as quota sampling. So these all would go under the unrepresentative heading, okay? The first we're going to talk about is the purposive sampling. Okay, so this is used when you want to have a study um, that contains only certain kinds of people. Okay, so you're only recruiting specific types of participants. So if you're looking at um, a study, but you only want to recruit smokers for some reason, you might recruit participants from a tobacco store only. Okay, so you have a purposive sample. You're only trying to find people who smoke for some reason. So you're going to a tobacco store to find smokers. So the opposite of this, if you want to um, have people in your participants who are a smoker, instead of going to a tobacco store and finding those smokers, you can call people in the community and figure out if they're smokers or not, and then have them participate in your study. Right. So going to the tobacco store is seeking out smokers, um, but those ones at that specific tobacco store might not represent everyone in the whole area. Right. So this is purposive. You're going to a spot that you know there's going to be smokers, you know there's going to be Democrats, you know there's going to be whatever you're looking at and recruiting those people. OK. Snowball sampling um, is a variation of purposive. So in this one, participants are asked to recommend other participants for the study. So, for example, you're studying drinking habits in people who are alcoholics. 
So a researcher might start with one or two people who have the condition and then ask them to recruit other people that they know. Okay, so a lot of times alcoholics are in support groups, AA, whatever it might be. So each individual participant might have friends that are alcoholics and say, hey, I know a study, you want to be involved. And then those people have acquaintances that are alcoholics, get them involved in the study, so on and so forth until you have the entire um, sample that you need. Okay, so the problem obviously is that you're recruiting via social networks, so it's not going to be random. So you could do this as well for, um, you know, getting people to participate in your study at a college, right? So you know someone in a psych class that wants to participate in the study, they tell their friends, they tell their friends, so on and so forth. So you're not getting a random assortment of college undergraduates, rather you're getting a snowball sample where people are recruiting people that they know. Okay, that one's my favorite of unbiased. And then we also have what's known as a quota sampling, um, which is similar to stratified random, um, but it's not random. So in this, the researcher identifies subsets of the population and sets a target number or a quota um, for each category, and then use non-random sampling until the quotas are filled. So for example, you're doing a study, you want 20 college freshmen, 20 sophomores, 20 juniors, and 20 seniors. Okay, so you can do any non-random sampling techniques to fill these. Um, so you could stand out stand outside of freshman classes and you know get 20 freshmen, stand outside junior classes, senior, so on and so forth, which again obviously is non-random because you're purpose purposive sampling those classrooms. Um, you could use snowball techniques, find one freshman and say, hey, go recruit. 19 of your friends, so on and so forth for junior, senior, sophomores, right? Any way of unbiased sampling technique until you meet the quota. So quota sampling, um, you're really trying to just like meet the quota, but you're using other sampling techniques that are biased to meet that. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. So obviously, in some cases, external validity is going to be a um, priority. So uh, for frequency claims, especially um, external validity is the main priority. So we want to make sure we have an unbiased or representative sample. Because um, frequency claims, again, remember reporting on how often something happens in a population. Okay, So it's important that we have a random assortment of people. Um, sometimes external validity is not as important. Okay, so um, association claims still could be accurate without a random sample. Um, so if we have a non-probability sample in the real world, it could be something like we want to um, see what the traffic's like on the highway. You have different apps that do this. For example, like uh, Waze navigation um, or different driving apps where people can report in the traffic conditions, right? That's non-probability because only certain people are using that app and going to be the ones to go in and say that there's an accident or the road's blocked or whatever they may be. But it's still going to be accurate because you only need one person, right, to report the accident. It's not like you need random sample of drivers all around the world to get accurate representation of traffic. Okay, so in the real world, there can be instances where we have non-probability samples that are still accurate. Um, in research studies, it gets a little bit more tricky. Um, so if you remember the example of researchers watching family at dinner time and they're videotaped and, you know, the researchers explain like what type of conversations and what tone of the conversation was, so on and so forth. Um, Obviously, only a certain type of person is going to let researchers come in and watch their family at dinner time. Okay, so obviously that's going to be a biased sample. You can't just randomly show up at whoever's dinner and watch them eat and see what they're talking about. Um, so obviously it's not going to be 
um, a random sample. We're going to have biased results, but that's really the best that we can do. Okay, so in all, we can't in every single case have the perfect unbiased random sample that we want. Um, in some cases, we're going to have to settle um, for some biased results and hope that it generalizes to who we want it to generalize to. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. And then the last slide here is just um, kind of talking about another thing that we have to take into consideration, which is sample size. Um, so when we're doing um, a study, obviously, unless we're doing a census, we're not sampling the entire population. So we now have to figure out what do we want our sample size to be. Okay, and this kind of gets into um, some statistics, which is not as important for this class. So I'm kind of going to skim over this stuff. Um, but large samples aren't necessarily more representative than smaller samples. If you have a small sam sample that is um, random and unbiased, that's going to be a good enough sample, even though it's small, it's going to represent that entire population. Okay, large samples aren't necessarily that good um, or that much better. Okay, um, so this table is showing the margins of error. So if we have 50 people, margin of error in the percentage is plus or minus 10, which is obviously not very good. Um, but if we move up, you can see that the margin of error gets smaller. So we have 1,500 participants and 2,000 participants, and we only get 1% better. Um, so researchers, what they're going to do is looking at look at the margin of error, and they kind of figure out at what point does it become unnecessary to get you know 500 more participants. At a certain point, you know, increasing the amount of participants, you're not going to get that much more accurate of results. So just take into account you know time, budget, resources, and figure out the um, best uh, sample size. And again, the sampling technique is typically in 99.999% of cases going to be more important than having a large sample size. Okay, so that's it for chapter seven. If you have questions, please let me know. Don't hesitate to ask. Um, uh, yeah, okay, bye.